So I apologize for giving you the five, but rather than go through the whole thing again, if you can just uh, determine for Game Sumicha, a Brahmacharya, and then uh, Vikila Pochana, not to take food at inappropriate times, and uh, all the rest. You know, yeah, I've been giving these precepts for so long. Now, when I give the precepts, I actually, it's a kind of meditation, I train myself so that the mind goes, I tune into the sound of silence, so then I, Bhutang Saranang Gachami. When I, before, when I, before I did this practice, then I'd always, I'd always, uh, you know, I'd do it in a kind of perfunctory way. And so I'd go, you know, I know I had to give the three refuges, like Bhutang Saranang Gachami, and then the people would repeat, and then I'd, sometimes I'd forget quite where I was at. Because the mind would wander or something. I forget, did I give the fourth precept or? <laughs> so when, when I, you know, or you can just rely on the momentum of, of, the, of the chanting itself. And then in uh, developing this, this uh, practice using sound of silence, and this, this puts me into a very mindful state, very present. And so then the, then the, Bhutang Sarnang Gachami comes out of, out of that silence rather than just the perfunctory uh, reciting of Pali formulas. I encourage you to, to try that, the chanting and all that, you know, the Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arato Samma Sambhutasa is, can be just a, uh, perfunctory recitation of Pali, or it actually can come out of the silence. And so, to me, this this to me this m makes it more than just a ceremonial custom tradition, Pali tradition, because one does, uh, you know, one begins to have doubts about that whether it's necessary and. And it oftentimes one gets rather bored with, with just repeating poly chants and going through the formulas. So in integrating the ceremonial side of Theravada Buddhism is, is, is you know this is the way I've done it. So it's not just going through the motions and because it's part of a tradition, it's kind of dutifully doing the ceremonies. So it's, uh, I found that this way, uh, that it has a potency to it, you know, so you, this coming out of silence rather than, than me just uh, trying to remember the Pali words. And then get it, the, because if I do that, if I come from the, just the thinking mind alone, then it, it does, you get, you get your mind maybe distracted and, and you can't, you know, can't quite remember. You know, I've gone through the whole, eight precepts and then wondered and can't remember having said any of them uh, from just the, the kind of habitual style of, of giving the, the uh, refuges and the precepts. So it's a way of training, you know, the, to, to, it's always returning to the pure presence here and now, Pachubhana and Tamma. Uh, and this is, uh, and this is, a, as I said before, is a natural state. It's not created. 
And the reason why I emphasize this natural state is because, it, you know, we we create ourselves, you know, so like the three fetters, uh, Sakya, Ditti, Sila, Bhattva, Paramasa, Vijayisha, these are creations. They're extremities of some sort. They come and go and change. They arise and cease. Or you go into have concentration, into absorptions, and, uh, and they are very dependent on conditions supporting uh, tranquility and absorption and so forth. And so they're, they're conditioned. But the mindfulness practice, Sati Sampachanya, is actually recognizing natural state of consciousness. Consciousness where, uh, where, where the creativity takes place in consciousness with intention rather than just uh, the uh, proliferating habits that we tend to keep reproducing endlessly into our consciousness through the self-view or the emotional habits or our desires and fears and so forth. So then in the, you know, like oneness, when we talk about dualism, you know, the where things are divided up and the sense the sense uh the sensual world is is uh, you know because it it's dualistic so whatever begins will end that's a dualism it's a birth and death is a dualism day and night uh wherever you have one you have the other you know so the the conditioned realm it has this has this dualism and Thought is dualistic, thinking. And so when, when we talk about mystical experience, or well, that's usually uh, a, a, the, the reality of oneness. But when you think about oneness, it doesn't work. Because then you get caught in theories or ideas, or maybe you had some kind of mystical uh, insight or experience previously but then you you attach to memory of it you know a memory of fear of experiencing oneness and then you you attach to the memory so the buddha encouraged us to to really get to the get to the source you know of this attachment how we attach out of ignorance out of habit out of not really looking and examining and investigating experience, but merely operating from views, opinions, ideas, from the self-views, from the conventions, without, you know, without getting beyond them, without having any reference beyond the conventional conditioned realm. So the the only way that one can can recognize the unconditioned Reality is that's awareness. Aparuta de sangamatasatavara. So that is uh, the gates to the deathless are open. So then using the word deathless or the unconditioned nibbana, Amaravati, the name of this monastery, deathless realm is that even though those are words, just like any other words, they're still, it's, it's not to be defined or thought about, but recognized. So it's sati sampachani, mindfulness, you begin to like observe, you're recognizing the here and now, it's like this. It's awakening, noticing, attentiveness, paying attention to the way it is. It's non-critical, so it's not like you're, you're, you know, you're saying it's better or worse or good or bad anymore, but it is, it's discerning, the conditions arise and cease. So oneness then the real, is reality, and uh, that which is one is consciousness. Now this isn't a doctrine, and a, a that I, do, I don't want you to grasp this idea, but just reflect on it in, in terms of your own experience. 
because each one of us is experiencing consciousness. So recognizing this is that that moment that here and now awakened observation consciousness before you create thoughts into it. Now that when I talk about sound of silence, this, this uh, um, when I you know that I recognize this natural kind of energetic or vibration or whatever kind of background which is, seems like a sound but it's not really a sound but it just this, this is the limitation of language so I'm not trying to define it or or kind of describe it so much as point to it and then by recognizing this then this is this is where like when I say Bhutang Sarnangachami, I'm actually in this silence, this sound of silence. Because then the self disappears. The sense of separate self and and me do have performing a ceremony or whatever. It it just naturally ceases. Uh, there's still consciousness. Then the Bhutang Sarnangachami comes from that stillness or that silence rather than from me giving you the precepts or you know, Ajahn Sumedho is a preceptor giving precepts and where it all becomes personal and separate. So this is uh, like an attempt this evening just to try to uh, point to this uh, because you know even the way we hold the convention of, of Buddhism can be from ignorance and self-view. As most of us start out with that, isn't it? We start, we can't help but start out with our ignorance and a sense of me trying to understand and get somewhere and attain something and becoming a Theravadan Buddhist or becoming a bhikkhu or becoming this or that. These are the, the you know, the the mind is programmed for this, this way of experiencing or uh, life. So in consciousness I create myself, I be ordained as a bhikkhu, so I become a bhikkhu, Buddhist monk. But then the, the practice is using the Four Noble Truths, which is the first one is the, the recognizing dukkha or this sense of dissatisfaction or longing or, you know, feeling a lack of something or something missing, an incompleteness. There can be, you know, you know, wanting something we don't have yet that we would like to or wanting to get rid of all our defilements and emotional problems and and become a, an arahant or whatever. But all this is, uh, you know, this is the dukkha, is, you know, matter, even if we grasp these beautiful concepts, these beautiful teachings, it's, uh, you know, it's a basic sense of a self that's created out of ignorance and the grasping that, that operates from that position is the, is the cause of suffering. So this is like to examine that. Now that's very clear teaching, taking something quite ordinary such as dukkha or suffering and uh, and examining. You know, now the, the problem that most of us have in meditation is we're, we're trying to think about it. We're trying, we, we analyze, we create ourselves endlessly uh, as uh, Buddhists and as personalities and and the view that we have about our attainments or lack of attainment. Though it goes on endlessly, you know, how one creates oneself and uh, just becoming a samana, a monk or a nun, you know, you still create yourself into that. But that's not the point, is it? It's not to to take on just another mask or facade of some sort, another costume, but to use the, the convention for awakened awareness 
investigation of Dhamma or the way it is. Now it's interesting that now at this time in the, in the Western world, there's so much interest now in in emptiness or the Dzogchen practices in Tibetan Buddhism and in uh, um, you know the uh, the uh, kind of Advaita approach uh, because uh, this this very much it is quite direct in the sense that it is uh, you know the uh, there seems to be enough uh, experience now among Western uh, Westerners, Europeans, Americans, and so forth, in in uh, being able to be mindful or recognize or realize the, this reality of here and now. So rather, you know, so we can start from suffering uh, because that's easy to see. You know, some people can't even admit their suffering. You know, they don't even know their suffering. So you can't really, you know, they can't, they, they just don't want, to, they aren't ready to even recognize that. But most, most people, the people that come, that I meet, are, you know, pretty much aware of their, of their, you know, their, their unhappiness or their, their tendency to worry and, I mean, even if it's relatively, you know, minor suffering, and in fact, it's not a great trauma, but just the the dreariness of life, the disappointment, the despair as you get older, unfulfilled wishes and disappointments and and uh, resentments that one accumulates on the personal level and through the experience, and that one holds in memories. But also, if we don't bring to attention, like this, this awareness as the practice, if we still, you know, many, uh, many of us started to want to get samadhi, get jhanas, get concentrated states, get something, get some kind of pleasant experience of tranquility or something from our practice, because that's the, how the, we're conditioned to, to think and to, to uh, regard the the universe around us through controlling the mind, through through uh, working hard, through concentrating the mind, and and uh, learning to uh, you know have these control mechanisms where we can focus on one thing and absorb into it. But still, I mean, that's, that's good, you know, that's a good thing to do. It's not something to despise. It can be skillful. But getting to the real source, then, is in recognizing the, the suffering of, of uh, self, the self-view. Uh, it's the first fetter, the sanyojanas in the ten fetter list. So this first fetter, the first sanyojana, is uh, sakya ditti, self-view or personality view. Now this I encourage you over and over again to uh, be aware of the self. It's not, you're not trying to get rid of self or judge it. It's not an attack or an annihilation of self, but a recognition. When we talk about self, what we're talking about is Sakya Ditti, the self we create into consciousness. We're not talking about consciousness. We're talking about what we create out of ignorance. So, so this is Sakya Ditti. So sometimes we, you know, we can grasp the teachings of the Buddha and say we've got to get rid of all selfishness or all self. We've got to become selfless. And this can be another form of self, isn't it? I'm somebody who's trying to get rid of selfishness. And I've got to, you know, destroy the self to realize to be that oneness of anatta or nibbana. 
can still be, you know, when you think in this way, it's still Sakya Ditti, isn't it? Still a sense of, I'm somebody doing something. I've got to get something or attain something I don't have yet. By getting rid of this uh, ego, this uh, selfishness, this sense of me and mine. So when we, when we uh, investigate in experience, uh, the here and now Dhamma, with this sound of silence, because that is like emptiness, consciousness, emptiness. And then in this stillness, there's no, you know, I'm not creating anything. I'm not creating myself. So what, what I, 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 I'm experiencing then is this stillness, this what I call silence, or like a vibratory sound has a continuity, a flowing quality. And I don't create it. It's not not like imagined or creative. Now, just learning to rest in this stillness, then the the any remnants of self view and me and mine disappear because the flowing that that flow is uh, you know it, it has a continuity. It doesn't doesn't begin and end like sounds ordinary sounds that we make with our voices or bird song or music or whatever has a beginning and end. So it, you know, it does, uh, one does have this sense of, of this beginning and ending of things. But this sound of silence then is, is like space, visual space, or I call it the reality, a, a, si a sign or recognition of consciousness because I'm caught con there's consciousness and awareness and then there's panya or wisdom discernment and so from this then this, this is where say these practices uh, that that come from the mindfulness practices are always pointing to this to to recognize it, because it, it's here and now, it's not something, it's not an attained state, it's just recognize, learning to recognize, it's just this. So it's like listening with patience, and a kind of relaxed, patient listening, recognizing. And how the, the mind will produce all kinds of doubts about it, and self-views, you know, will come forth because uh, emotionally we're not we're not programmed, we're not conditioned for the unconditioned. You know, as personalities and culturally we're programmed for happiness and suffering and success and failure and praise and blame and and so forth. We want we want the best and we don't want the worst. We want to go to heaven, not to hell. We want happiness and peace and love and all the best and we don't want war and pain and misery and and rejection, anger and hatred. So emotionally we, we tend to, you know, how we can kind of react emotionally when somebody praises me, you know, they say, yo, great teacher, wonderful teacher, Ajahn Sumato, and then praise feels like this. You know, on the Sakyaditi level, it, it reaffirms a sense of my self-importance, my attainment, my, that I'm accepted or appreciated, I'm respected. So there's a feeling of happiness or ease or that by, through praise on the personal level. Or, if somebody, you know, starts criticizing or blaming me and abusing me verbally, you know, they say, you're no good, you don't know what you're talking about, you're... Then, on the Sakya Ditti level, it feels, you know, the, the, you feel angry or 
hurt or offended or misunderstood or exasperated. So these emotions, you know, they're, they're conditioned through the eight worldly dhammas, the uh, success and failure, happiness, suffering, uh, praise and blame, this dualism of the conditioned realm. So this is where, you know, you can't trust your, the emotions are what they are. You know, and I'm, and I'm not, you know, I, people criticize and blame me. You know, I've never learned to feel happy about that. Somebody says, you're, you're a disgusting old pig, you know. <laughs> you know, it doesn't rouse happiness in my mind. But it arouses, uh, you know, of being offended, personally being offended. But there's an awareness of this, isn't it? You can be aware of uh, being offended or being exhilarated by praise. And so this is this is where you know the the, the mindfulness uh, is to uh, recognize this natural state where where we can, uh, you know, we have a, a reference point, we have perspective on the worldly dhammas that we, we have to live with. We have to live with the bodies we have, with the emotional habits that we've acquired, with our memories, our personalities, our melodramas, our obsessions and fears and doubts and worries. But our relationship to it changes from grasping ignorance and grasping and and being caught in the momentum of of emotional up and down isn't it like if you if you're just emotional then you go up and down all the time you're just kind of a helpless victim and things are going well you're happy things are going all wrong you're miserable and there's emotions of happy miserable happy miserable bored fed up Absolutely fantastic. <laughs> they go from, from you know, from one extreme to the next. Or sometimes you know, when life gets really in the monastic life, you know, where we really get fed up with it, is when it's not extreme. When it gets boring, routine thing, morning chanting, evening chanting. You know, not can even even opera or anything. You can. No more, that's a monotone chanting. You can express your true creativity and your your inner soul on a personal level because you're bound to to a tradition that insists on monotone chanting. And so we we get bored and fed up. But these are also emotions. I mean, being bored and being fed up and and uh, so forth is it, these are emotional habits. You know, because we we would like to be happy, uh, blissed out. You know, to be to have life uh, as an experience of the absolutely fantastic. So that's why pointing to to pure consciousness or sound of silence or space, just contemplating visual space. You know, you you're learning to recognize. You're recognizing that which is here and now, which has no extremity to it. It is what it is. When you, is space good or bad, or is it beautiful, ugly? You know, is, it is it's spacious. Or consciousness, is it is it fa absolutely fantastic or absolutely miserable or? What we create into consciousness and into space can be, you know, space can, uh, you know, beauty or ugliness can enter our visual, in, enter a room and we, we are affected by the beautiful or the ugly accordingly. Or consciousness, we can create hell or heaven in consciousness. But to awaken, like Bhutto, Bhutang Sarnangachami, this, this, the very name of the Buddha is significant because it's awakened consciousness. Now, now this is about you. 
each one of us. It's not about, you know, some some Buddha or somebody who's who's very advanced and somebody in the past or somebody in the Himalayan mountains that's fully enlightened Arahant or whatever. <laughs> it's about you and me right now. It's not we're not pointing to far away or somebody else. Because you have to admit you're each one of you is conscious, experiencing consciousness right now. Anyone unconscious right now? <laughs> Now the sense of itself is is a uh, is a real burden, you know, like self consciousness, and because on uh, you know one one is uh, you know on the worldly level of the eight worldly dharmas, there's always so much concern about you know what people think, how do I look, uh, what do people think of me. Um, you know, not wanting to stand out, uh, wanting to, uh, you know, if, talking today to someone about having to, to, to stand out in a crowd or say something in public, and you can get very nervous. You know, just suddenly you say, like <laughs> taking the precepts, and suddenly you're the one, <laughs> somebody is focused on you and. And you have to recite um, bana dibata, where you can feel very upset or nervous or anxious, just even though you may have done it a hundred times, because uh, the self is like that. You're putting yourself out in in a in a you, you know in a position where you can be, you can make mistakes, you can screw everything up, you can do something wrong, you can make a fool of yourself. Uh, you're you're standing out in some way that that can be to the ego is very can be very threatening. So, like in in my own practice, training myself. Uh, in uh, I remember in the navy when I first uh, I ended, I enlisted in the in the navy when I was 19 years old. And so then you you know you just you go into these boot camps as they flew me down from Seattle, Washington to San Diego, California. First time away from home and uh, put you in these what they call boot camps or training camps. First thing they do is they shave your head. So I say they shave my hair off like I like it is now. They put you in. They give you these uh, what they call dungarees. So they give you these baggy uh, trousers and shirts, kind of like denim, called dungarees, and, and uh, white hats. And we and we we're all young youths from from all over the the states. So we you know we all come with our own style, our own kind of clothes and hairstyle and whatever. And then within a few hours. We're all looking like plucked chickens, you know. Look pathetic, I remember. And then, of course, this is a military outfit, so they yell at you all the time and call you every foul thing they can think of. So they say, you idiot, and you say, yes, sir. <laughs> well, when you're, when you're not in the military, they say, you idiot, you those are fighting words, you know. <laughs> But in training, you just, you know, you just say, this is part of the game, you know. So you, you know, it doesn't, you really don't take it that personally. Because everybody's been called an idiot. <laughs> but then when, when you sell, when you do have to stand out and say something or that, it's scary. Because it also, they've got power and can punish you or humiliate you. You know, so I used to be, be petrified half the time and, group scenes in the military because if standing out was dangerous you, you could really be punished or persecuted for saying something that they didn't want to hear or didn't like or may, make a fool of yourself 
Well, these these condition you, and there's a conditioning process, this sense of self learning how to be politically correct, say it in a nice way, uh, play the game properly, survive in the system. Is all about the eight worldly dhammas, learning how to to get through the family, the parents that you have, so that they aren't always persecuting you or punishing you. You learn how to get along in school, how to get along, you know, so the teacher, you and the teacher, you know, bring her a, an apple, <laughs> the apple polishers. <laughs> Other less poetic words for that, <laughs> but uh, it's a way of surviving, learning to survive in the system, in the, in the school system, in the family system, in the military, in the society, in the university, in the office, in the factory, wherever. So we are programmed, you know, we, uh, how to survive. Uh, on that condition level of reward and punishment. Like being praised is a reward, isn't it? Being punished is, is, is its opposite. So, uh, you know, when you contemplate your personality, you know, well, this is just the way we are, and this is the way the, the world, the culture operates, whatever society is in, it has its own values and its own rights and wrongs and shoulds and shouldn'ts. You know, whether you're in America or Britain or Thailand or wherever, you know, China or Japan or wherever, you've got, you know, you have the the reward punishment as part of the conditioning process, what, I call, kind of civiliz- what we call civilization. And uh, and we pick that up, you know, learn how to survive in the system, get along in the system. So I remember uh, when the hippie movement began to reach Thailand, back in the, this is about early 70s, and I was a monk with Ajahn Chah, and, and uh, hippies, you know, they started getting publicity in the Bangkok newspapers, and they always had bad publicity because they were associated with drugs and immoral behavior. And um, and they had and they weren't neat and dressed, you know, in nice suits and things. They were had long hair and beards and wore all kinds of strange paraphernalia and and whatnot. And so they looked you know, really weird and strange and alien and untrustworthy to the, to, the, to the people in Thailand at that time. And so they, in the, they got terrible press, you know, but so they were all just a bunch of degenerate drug addicts and, uh, you know, no good types. And so, anyway, Lung Po Cha, I remember we were discussing, this was brought to his attention, hippies need. So he asked me, he says, what is a hippie? <laughs> and I said, oh, well, they're, uh, they're people that have seen through the hypocrisy of the system and they refuse to cooperate. <laughs> and he said, oh, oh, he said, they should become monks. <laughs> <laughs> He said, go to Bangkok and get, bring them to Wat Pa <laughs> Oh, he didn't have to do that. They started drifting there anyway, so. <laughs> but it's interesting, his rep- uh, because, you know, the monasticism, you know, is in Thailand, it's a way out of the system. The social system or the uh, expectations of the world lay values of that society, become a Meiji, a nun or a monk or whatever, it, it gives you an option out to operate outside. But it's not, but it isn't, isn't just, you know, of course it, it is based on precepts, so we re, refrain from taking drugs and drink and we're celibate and so forth. So this is, is not like, you know, exploring every sensual opportunity or, you know, throwing away the values of your society as an act of rebellion. But for me, it gave an option, a way of, 
of stepping out of the society and the pressures of that society to reflect and contemplate the meaning of life. What am I here for anyway? What is the purpose of life? Because when I entered the monastic life, I was pretty fed up with it. With, not with monasticism, but with, <laughs> with, with the lay life. Because, it, you know, I had enough experience to, it all became meaningless for me. And uh, just seeking happiness and sensual pleasure and, and all that, you know, didn't, you know, after so much of that, it just was boring. And, I mean, you know, I didn't, it didn't create a sense of self-respect. I just se seemed to go into kind of a drifting mode of just, getting by. So the monastic life, you know, the, you know, as I experienced it in Thailand, and then I found this very good teacher, Lung Po Cha, who was very strict on the, on the disciplinary side. So this put me into, this was a, quite a challenge to conform because my whole, my whole personality was based on the ideal of individuality and nonconformity. I consider myself as a person a nonconformist because that's how that's my self image. I I had a kind of snooty contempt for con, for these stupid middle class conformists. So I, I could be just as snobbish as they could in my own way. You know, so this is our individuality and my creative habits and me and self-expression and all that. I, you know, I had an opportunity to explore that because in my own society and in my generation there, there was that, you know, opportunity to explore the extremities of sense experience and so forth or personality. But at the end of the day, was just miserable. Dukkha was became so strong, uh, and yet it wasn't because of being called an idiot or <laughs> it was just just this sense of incompleteness, of meaninglessness, purpose. Life had no purpose to it, and so in uh, in this because I did have this this confidence or something in me responded and felt such a connection to the teachings of the Buddha that this obviously, you know, was and living in Southeast Asia, then I had the chance to, to investigate and explore the, the possibility in Thailand. Well, then there's, then of course, in the training and that with the emphasis that Lung Po Cha made on practice, you know, it was always, the whole point was this awakened attention. So it wasn't just a reward and punishment for, you know, getting praise for being a good monk and, and uh, you know, going through the same, you know, developing the same habits only within a more kind of an unusual style, lifestyle. But getting to the root of the cause the cause of suffering, ignorance, attachment to conditions out of ignorance. So then this awakenedness, this sati sampachanya, now this is the essence. This is the essence of, of the Buddha's teaching, this emphasis on mindfulness. Because this is the only opportunity we have to be free from suffering is through awareness. Otherwise, we're we're merely caught into the conditions. We have no we lose perspective because we're always being influenced and overwhelmed by our habits, our memories, our, our thoughts, and so forth. And the the only way to get out of that vortex is through awareness. So when we say the gate to the deathless, the door to the deathless is open, aparuta de sangamatasa that means 
to me, that means that that just that, that means this awareness is the gate. Just this simple attentiveness in the present. Now then, as I began to recognize it, because before I tried to, to I wanted concentration, so I'd get confused all the time about concentrating the mind. Because it's, there's so much sense of, you know, trying to hold on or get something, or a tranquil state, wanting tranquility. And uh, fortunately, Lung Po Cha was, was uh, the kind of, he never let me get too tranquil. <coughs> because he, his whole, his aim was to really open me to to the present moment, wherever I was, whatever I was doing. So the, the monastic form began to to make sense as a way of living, because you know, sitting, standing, walking, lying down, putting on your robes, making your robes, dyeing your robes, washing them, or or eating your going on the alms round, eating food, just the most ordinary, banal things that one does in one's daily life was was included, you know, it wasn't just sitting in samadhi uh, in a quiet place. So I found, you know, at first I felt quite rebellious towards this because I, I, uh, you know, I'm a, a personally, I like samadhi a lot. I like to go into tranquility, and shut everything out, all the confusing worldly conditions and go into a nice tranquil samadhi state quite quite like that <laughs> but you know then one you know if you have no perspective on that then you then you resent everything else your life is just all you're doing is living for the next chance to for samadhi where the where the uh, awareness is means that you become aware of that of the desire to get something you don't have or the desire to get rid of the noise and confusion or distraction you you begin to awaken and observe these these desires you know wanting to get rid of wandering mind boredom uh anger greed whatever or wanting to you know wanting to attain achieve and attain samadhi or nibbana or arahantship or whatever you know it's still d- desire so this uh, this the second noble truth is is a really you know a study of desire and because in consciousness desire arises and ceases in consciousness consciousness is not desire so and yet desires wanting sensual desire wanting pleasurable sense experiences or desire to attain and achieve or desire to get rid of the the noise and confusion these are, these desires they arise and cease so our relationship then to desire is a knowing relationship rather than a, a, an attempt to get rid of it or suppress desire, but to recognize it. So that which can recognize it, like consciousness, as we're experiencing it right now, we, you know, we can actually be aware of the desires that we're experiencing here and now. If we don't, if we're not mindful, and we don't notice desire, then we, we tend to just be pulled into it. You know, we just caught into every desire that goes through our consciousness, helpless victims of it. But if we recognize it, then the desires come and go according to conditions. But, you know, they are what they are, and our relationship to them is knowing, is the puto, pure awareness, pure consciousness, and seeing the, and recognizing the suffering we create by attaching to desire out of this ignorance. And so this is, you know, this is uh, 
the whole point of our life and practice, so that you, if the deathless, the unconditioned, nibbana, uh, the the Pali word anatta, non-self, isn't an annihilation of consciousness, is it? It's not not a, so, you know. It's not a to to kill yourself, slit your throat, or something. <laughs> But to to uh, recognize, realize your true nature is this. So in uh, say this monastic form, you know how to use it for that. You know to not to use it for worldly values or attainments or causes or things like that, but. If we do that, if we begin to recognize the suffering we create by wanting and not wanting. So in my own life as a monk, you know, this is this is been a, this is a great opportunity. You know, I've had, which I look back on now, I'm forever grateful because, you know, the the suffering that I used to experience. That doesn't, I don't have that. I mean, that's it. See, you know, I've studied, examined it, explored it to see, to be able to let go of the causes for that sense of a self or worry, anxiety, self consciousness, fears, jealousies, uh, despair, boredom, and these um, so much negative emotions. Uh, you, you know that one was that I was involved with on a personal level. Well, through this kind of practice, you, you know, now after forty years, I know better. And if you've studied something, examined something that long, you know, you and it, it is very, you know, it's just some, it's not a, you know. A, it's just the result of of cultivating this this way, and so when I when I talk about consciousness now, what I'm trying to do is to is, is this you know encouragement to begin to just trust the the simplicity of awakeness and just the recognition and and not not judge yourself or think about yourself or believe any of the things you do think about yourself. You know, don't you know so we th- we think about ourselves in terms of of uh, values of being good, bad, or right or wrong or whatever. But and so you know these thoughts still arise in my mind. It's just that I don't have them, but I know what they are. I know them, so I don't grasp. I determine not to grasp them or operate from from that. Uh, from those those perceptions, but still, they still they still come and go according to conditions like the moon phases of the moon and <laughs> so this is uh, encouragement, um, you know, to you know to reflect on how to use the monasticism not for personal identity or or uh, to become anything, it's it's merely an expedient means for awareness. That's that's its purpose. It's not meant to be an identity that we are attached to. And but we do attach to it, and because that's our habit, and then so that, therefore uh, the incur you know the, but then the suffering that results. There's always unhappiness or blaming or complaining or resentments and and uh, things you don't like about the convention, uh, things that irritate you about it, uh, things you resent, and uh, you know it's just. But that's all, you know. That's if we we spend our monastic life trying to make the convention what we want, we've kind of wasted our life. But it is the way it is, based on moral 
principles and on awareness. I mean, this is, this is, you know, in terms of a convention, it's it's adequate for seeing clearly if we use it for what it's meant to be used for. So I offer this as a reflection.